So good evening. I am Paul Carice. I'm the director of this new academic unit at Arizona State University, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. And it's my honor to welcome you to the second event in a year-long series of lectures and discussions we're sponsoring this year on free speech and intellectual diversity in higher education and American society. And we're delighted to be co-sponsoring the entire series with two ASU partners, the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications and the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. My department, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, is convening experts on free speech and also a broader array of civic and intellectual leaders in American life to explore the new wave of heated debates and clashes on American campuses about freedom of speech, civility, diversity, and inclusion. Recent episodes of violence and the widespread concern about a narrowed range of discourse on many campuses are vitally important concerns for educators, but also for American politics generally and for our civic fabric. The violent clashes on some campuses reflect and reinforce the violent polarization and civic discord that has grown in American life in recent years. So the school plans to collect all of these events, the lectures, the dialogue, debate events, and our two-day conference in February um, into a published book at the end of the year. And as you can see, we're also very happy to be collaborating with Arizona PBS on recording several of these events for airing later in the year. So just a brief word further about the mission of the school, and then I'll introduce our two distinguished guests. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is dedicated to reviving the link between civic education and liberal education in order to prepare thoughtful leaders for society and for public service. We think that studying great works and great debates of our intellectual tradition, civic, economic, moral, and political thought, supplemented by internships and broader public experiences, events like this, is a great foundation for preparing leaders not only for America, but for our globalized world. We also think that a return to some fundamental ideas and debates might provide a broader and a calming perspective in our polarized and divided times. So that leads us to tonight's event and to our two distinguished speakers. A fundamental issue of our time is, in higher education and American life generally, how we exercise freedom of speech so that it serves the higher purpose of helping us to be self-governing as a people. That higher aim seems to require that we tolerate and indeed respect fellow citizens who have differing views, often views diametrically opposed to our own. It would also seem that this ethic of civil disagreement should be especially respected and cultivated on our college and university campuses. So with us tonight to provide a model of this kind of disagreement but civil disagreement and to explore the causes of our current polarization and civic strife, but also to discuss some possible remedies, we have two distinguished public servants. They have strongly different policy views, one a conservative Republican and one a liberal Democrat, but they are here tonight for dialogue as well as debate. Tom Daschle began his career in public service as an officer in the United States Air Force in the Vietnam War era, then uh, served on active duty from 1969 to 1972. Then in 1976, he was elected to the US House of Representatives from South Dakota, and he served eight years there, four terms. After that, he was elected as United States Senator representing South Dakota for three full terms from 1987 to 2005. For more than half of his 18 years in the Senate, he was either the Senate Minority Leader or Senate Majority Leader for the Democratic Party. It occurs to me that his Senate career with the majority in the Senate regularly changing hands captures the rise of a new kind of partisan division in America an era of very fiercely contested elections and of nearly never-ending campaigns. Overlapping with him in the US Capitol for many of those years was John Kyle, who was elected to the US House of Representatives from Arizona in 1986, also served for four terms in the House, and then he was elected to the US Senate from Arizona in 1994 and served three terms there. During his 18 years in the Senate, he also served in the Senate leadership as the minority whip for the Republicans. That's the number two leadership position, and he held that leadership position for eight years. So please join me in welcoming Senator Daschle and Senator Kyle.
We have agreed to divide our time tonight into three segments, and then uh, we will have a fourth segment for question, uh, questions from the audience. So the first segment is a discussion about our general political civil discord, our polarization, uh, an era in recent years in which on campuses and in broader American life, we have people who demonize those of opposing views. There's this phenomenon of negative partisanship where people join parties more because they really dislike the other side as much as for believing in certain political principles. So I wanted to ask each of you to start, and I'll start with Senator Dasha. Why, why do you think there has been this recent turn toward a, a, an angry kind of polarization and partisanship? Well, Paul, first let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here with Senator Kyle. I have admired him a great deal for many, many years and respect his commitment to public service and uh, really have been looking forward to the opportunity to be here tonight and, uh, and to be on this campus. Uh, this is an amazing story you tell at uh, Arizona State with regard to the progress you're making and the size you are today and it's, uh, it's a real, real pleasure to be here. I, I think I would start by saying I think the issue is very, very complicated because it's uh, multidimensional. I think at, at its core, a big part of it is, is a debate about the role of government in modern society, uh, a debate that has become ideological and tactical. Uh, ideological, clearly, and I, I call it the noise of democracy. Uh, it's not very stereophonic. It's very hard to listen to. But it sure beats the, the alternatives, the noise of violence in Syria, or no noise at all in countries where you're arrested for speaking out. So the noise of democracy is playing itself out in full volume. Um, unfortunately, in my view, uh, there's not enough people, as we look at the tactical side of this, who believe that it's important to find common ground because it's becoming more and more of a test of those participating in this noise of democracy to stand your ground. Uh, that compromises capitulation. And that, to me, is a very troubling aspect to all of this. But there are other, two other things that I'd, I'd mention just to start. Second, I think, I think there's, a, there's a global engagement fatigue going on. 15 years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq, $2.7 trillion, uh, uh, a, a, a perception that trade and globalization is, is, uh, the, is, is the basis for the loss of millions of good jobs. And so it's ironic and, and very troubling to me personally, as a supporter of trade, that both parties had anti-trade planks in their, in their platform in the last convention. So that's going on. And then the third thing I think is income inequality and income stagnation. Just one fact that really resonated with me. In 1950, it took 45 hours of, of average monthly rent to pay for an average um, uh, apartment or a house in rent. Uh, it now takes 101. Uh, 101 hours of, of average uh, uh, income uh, hourly income to pay for uh, uh, one month's rent. So that income stagnation and that sense that there are those at the top that are benefiting more than the others is driving a tremendous frustration and animosity directed towards Washington. Senator Kyle. Thanks. First of all, let me begin by complimenting uh, Senator Daschle. Uh, we disagreed in the Senate, but I cannot, I was asked earlier, well, what did you work with Senator Daschle on and did you ever have disagreements with him? I can't remember any. I'm sure I was standing by Trent Lott's side when he was either minority or you were majority or vice versa when you were negotiating how many judicial nominations to bring up and the like, because I do remember that. But uh, I think you'll find in Senator Daschle someone who uh, was repeatedly re-elected as leader because of his capacity to work with all members of the Senate. And I want to say that his presence here tonight is really a, um, a favor to me, if you will, uh, because he came in this morning and he's leaving tonight. This is not a vacation time for him. So we've promised him another venue where he could perhaps enjoy our hospitality a little bit more. So thank you, Tom. Um, First of all, I'm, I'm going to agree with everything that you said and then add some more. As you said, it's multi-dimensional. And I think the causes that Senator Daschle articulated are all part of it. Let me add some more uh, to that, or at least some, some additional uh, facets of it. 
Part of the political division of the country, I believe, is caused by a, the, an emerging cultural divide. Margaret Thatcher used to make the point that culture drives politics, and I think that's significantly the case. We no longer have the same basis of value or the same belief in key fundamental principles that used to unify us. And that division uh, then translates into public discourse and eventually into politics. A lot of it begins on universities. I mean, let's face it, universities are where a lot of new things began. This is, you know, first of all, people have the ability to express themselves in ways that are unorthodox or unconventional in universities, or they should have that ability. And that then creates more thinking and debate, and pretty soon you've got full-blown movements, and a lot of them start on universities. Uh, I think a long time ago, not, not a long time ago, uh, more than a decade ago perhaps, but not much more, um, there were some ideas that began to uh, uh, be promoted in academia that have the unfortunate effect of creating divisions within our society that I think are unnecessary or in any event are, are very unproductive to problem solving as a unified country. I think that's part of it. Part of it is also exacerbated by those who amplify media, Hollywood. Let me pick on media for just a moment. There's no, you cannot cut back on the First Amendment. You should not do that. On the other hand, part of the problem is driven by people on talk radio and television who constantly fan the flames. They're not interested in civil discourse. Nobody keeps tuned to the channel if it's civil. Nobody reads, the, reads on past the headline. Uh, they are more interested in either taking advantage of a conflict or fight or creating one. And they also appeal to the worst of our, the, the, the worst of our, our cultural side. If you're on the left, uh, as Senator Daschle said, you're told you'd better not agree with or even cooperate with the other side because that would give them legitimacy. And as we know, they have no legitimacy, so don't work with them. That would just uh, create the proposition that, that they deserve to be listened to. And on the Republican side, since I'm a Republican, let me take a shot at this. There are uh, talk radio and TV hosts on, on famous television channels <laughs> who constantly um, go to the side of demagogy and uh, emotional uh, rants rather than try to seek out the common ground that would help us to find a way to, to unify ourselves. And this drives politics because in effect some of these people are so famous that they can create a political situation in which if a political servant deigns to take a contrary position, they'll make sure that the folks back home hear about it and they may even personally participate in funding or supporting a primary opponent and so on. There are other manifestations of this, but I just wanted to add those two additional factors to what Senator Daschle uh, articulated. And could I just add one yes. thing to, to what John said, because I think he's absolutely right. I would add the social media uh, and the yeah. impact of social media in particular. Truth is just an option today. Uh, and unfortunately, because truth is just an option, it's very hard to discern what is truth and what is not. And, uh, and, and it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to try to figure that out. Uh, but, but we're getting inundated. And, and because it's so easy to tweet or to, uh, to Facebook or do whatever you're going to do on social media today, everything is much more spontaneous. Not much thought is given sometimes to the expressions in social media. And that adds, I think, even more to this incredible uh, confrontational environment that we're li living with today. I want to follow up by asking two uh, people who were very senior in our government, right, about what the stakes are here. Um, our third segment, we're going to focus on Congress, on, on the House and the Senate, and the, the manifestation of this polarization and, and frustration and anger there. But just in general, what, what are the stakes if there's this kind of rancor and demonizing and, and frustration and anger? What is it we're not getting done or not able to address in our, in our national political life? Why, why, why should we be concerned about this kind of acrimony? Sure, John. We'll probably talk more about the political things that aren't getting done that should be um, 
more uh, capably addressed in the Congress, for example. But it, it manifests itself in many other ways. Uh, the, the ability to solve problems from the very, uh, the most uh, grassroots levels of government all the way up is impacted by this because instead of viewing yourself as a fellow citizen of Tempe looking at some kind of uh, zoning case, for example, you kind of divide up into different camps because your motives obviously are suspect because you are on the side of X and you obviously don't know what you're talking about because you've been associated with these bad actors. And the next thing you know, you can't have a civil debate with anybody anymore. It's not just in Washington, D.C. It affects families. Uh, it used to be we just wouldn't talk about certain things at the Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> now, um, I, I won't get personal, but it's not, it's not fun. And so it's not just in Washington, D.C. Um, it's just hard to have, and, and, the manifest, and, and, the, and the result of that is you don't feel unified as a country. You're fighting about things like taking a knee and all of that, and you, you ask yourself, isn't there something more important that we can focus on together and be unified about so that we have some chance of really facing the big things like the international crises that develop? I think John's exactly right. I, I would say that there are three major concerns that I have about this, uh, the current state. The first is that it makes it very, very hard to govern. And as we've seen with the dysfunction in Washington, and unfortunately that's spreading now, I, I don't know what it's like in Arizona, but in many states you, you have the same degree of acrimony and the same confrontational environment, so governance becomes so much harder. Secondly, as the, as the tone escalates and as the confrontational environment continues, the real possibility that we could see Charlottesville and, and more violence is very, very troubling to me, and I'm concerned about that escalating confrontational tone that, uh, that both sides seem to be taking. And then the third is, is something John alluded to, and that is our, our image abroad. You know, we were always the democracy on a pedestal, and we were the standard by which people judged how well governance should look and, and, and uh, how, how it should function. Um, as, as we were talking before the program started, as we travel abroad today, it's amazing uh, how many questions we get and, and how concerned people are as they watch what's going on. It's, they're consumed, really, by, by the state of politics in the United States. And they're very, it's usually the first question out of the box when you're traveling abroad. Okay, so to, to finish this first segment, I want to pose to each of you um, the challenge. What are some specific ideas each of you have about how we could turn the corner, some specific remedies for finding reasonable civil debate and finding some way to get to compromise and to governing? Well, mine are, are too simplistic, but I'll, I'll, I, Archibald MacLeish was our poet laureate and uh, was our, our library of Congress, uh, li librarian of Congress for almost 10 years. And he, when he was the librarian of Congress, he chose not to write poetry uh, with one exception. Uh, he went to Arlington National Cemetery and he wrote this unbelievably powerful poem. If, if I could give you one reading assignment tonight, it would be to check out, go Google our dead young soldiers. One of the lines in that poem is, uh, and he, t he speaks as a soldier who has who is now lost his life. And this soldier is speaking to his country. And one of the lines is, I give you my death, give them its me give it its meaning. And his message to all of us is, we have to understand there are only two ways to keep this democracy strong. You either have to fight for it as, as that soldier did and as John McCain has and so many of uh, our, our, our uh, Americans have, a million people have lost their lives fighting for this country. Uh, and if we aren't gonna fight, fight or aren't, aren't called upon to fight for it, then we have to work at it. We have to, we have to be engaged. This isn't a spectator assignment. This is really something that, in, that requires our involvement. And I, I, I worry, um, voter turnout isn't what it should be. You know, people who want more civil discourse are kind of letting the others take the stage. I think we've got to show real engagement and work at it. That's number one. And number two, leadership starts at the top. And our political leaders have to help set the tone. And unfortunately, we're not getting much of that today. 
as I say, these are simple and these are obvious, but I think the two biggest things as I look to the country, are we gonna have the leadership and are we gonna have the engagement on the part of the American people? We did not uh, plan this ahead of time, but uh, it, that's part of my speech. Um, <laughs> you said Glad I got better. to go first. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, you, you, you put the poem in there, which, uh, which adds to it. I'm, I'll steal that from you. But we're going to talk more about this in the third segment when we talk about the political. What, what's, what are some of the remedies in the political context? But one of the things I talk about there, and I've, I've tried to think about all the different reforms that we could do, and there are some we could try to experiment with, but at the end of the day, this system works if you have an informed and engaged electorate, Senator Daschle's number one point, and you have leaders with the ability to teach, to lead, and to have courage, number two. I, I've thought about all of the other things that we could do, but at the end of the day, it takes the people to make the system work. But also, Senator Daschle said something in the beginning that I think is important. I think we should uh, try to tease out a little bit as time goes on here tonight. For over 200 years, we had a relatively common set of foundational principles that we believed in and, and, and values. Well, we disagreed, we fought. You know, Jefferson and Adams fought like cats and dogs, but they just came out of a very unifying experience, the revolution, and they didn't disagree at all about the concepts that were embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Um, one of them thought the other one was gonna be a monarchist, and the other one thought the other one was gonna be an anarchist. But they both believed in a common set of, of fundamental values, which enabled them to work through all of this, even though they called each other really bad names, just like is happening today. So. We've had this before in our history, but we had an advantage of kind of being together, united on the basics that we could come back to. Now, I'm, I'm afraid I see our society, our culture first, and then it's manifested later in politics, kind of like the universe is exploding, just uh, not relying on the common values and common understandings as much anymore. And when you can't do that, it's hard to find common ground, even if you are civil. And part of this whole thing is that they, people then view the object of their uh, effort to be so important that it doesn't matter whether you're civil or not. In fact, maybe the other side doesn't even deserve uh, you to be civil to them. So I think it does start with the culture. Uh, it starts with some qualities in leadership and qualities in the people we've got to get back to. If I, I don't mean to filibuster here, one more thing. How do you get back to it? Well, one way you get back to it is to teach things in school that aren't taught as much as they were back in the olden days when Senator Dash and I were going to school. Basic civics, what, what are the two key things about the Declaration of Independence that everybody in America should know? Because that's what you're fighting for. Uh, how, how do you teach kids what is important to, to, as a template, not to agree with each other on, but at least to analyze the problems against a common set of of ideas here. Um, if you don't learn that in school, uh, you're gonna be too busy working to, to learn it later, probably, and therefore I think it goes back to our secondary and, and university system. Okay, so now we're gonna hold the senators to their word in our <laughs> second segment and see if we can have a reasonable civil disagreement <laughs> about uh, a set of policy issues that we agreed to discuss in advance. So we'll, we'll start with Senator Daschle, who will have set period of time to propose a policy, and uh, Senator Kyle will have time to respond, and then Senator National will get, will get the final word uh, in this segment. And we agreed to talk about the idea of a carbon tax, which brings in a whole range of American political issues and contentious issues. So, Senator Daschle, the floor is yours. Well, I would say the ultimate demonstration of civility is for John to ask me what the topic should be. And so, <laughs> This is a topic I chose only because John was kind enough to let me do so. So I thank him for that. Well, but I, I suggested two possible and he chose one of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> However, we-, we So agree. anyway, to, <laughs> let me just start by acknowledging what I think is the problem and what I think is commonly perceived to be the problem. We measured 400 million parts uh, 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 of CO2, 
parts per, 400 million uh, parts per million uh, CO2 in 2016. That's the highest level of CO2 in our atmosphere in three million years. 2016 was the hottest year we've had in history, and it's the third of three years of the hottest years we've ever had in history. 800 million people in the world are affected today. 194 countries have now agreed that we ought to set as a goal in 2050 that we keep our warmth, our increase in temperature by two degrees, which means that we have to reduce the level of CO2 in our atmosphere by 95% below what it was in 2000 to reach that goal. So, so we have a, a major challenge and, uh, and, and we are one of the two biggest contributors to the challenge and the problem as it exists today. From a public policy perspective, there are only four options. The first option is to cap and trade. We've done some of that in the past. California has done it. Europe has done it. Very complicated, very difficult to enforce, but cap and trade is one. The second are subsidies, to pay people not to, or to do the right thing or not to do the wrong thing. The third is regulation. And regulation, of course, uh, is an anathema to many people, and, and it's, it's very inefficient in many respects. A carbon tax is by far the simplest and most efficient approach you can use. Uh, if you apply it to upstream sources like coal mines and refineries, it's the only option of those four where you can get 95% of the CO2 uh, and affect it in, in, a, in a significant way. So from a uh, a policy perspective, its simplicity is one of the biggest uh, uh, reasons why I think it's so, so uh, uh, important. The second is right now there's, there's no consequence for utilization of fossil fuels uh, or for uh, how much carbon we put into the atmosphere. We need a price point. A price point could make a big difference. A price point on carbon would make a huge difference as manufacturers calculate what is their carbon cost in bringing things from China to the United States. So it would create a whole new opportunity for job creation here closer to the source. You wouldn't be having to pay the carbon taxes that others are, uh, that, that we're now, uh, uh, that we would be paying if, if we had the, the tax. So the third thing that I think is, is, is also critical is that there are a lot of, of uh, sort of non-carbon uh, 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 advantages. Uh, congestion would go down, uh, the number of vehicle uh, accidents go down, road maintenance goes down. Uh, that's also a, a real advantage. Um, I think that one of the things that, uh, that I was surprised at is how broad the support for a carbon tax is today. Um, uh, it, uh, 53% of the Gallup uh, in the most recent poll, 53% of all Americans said they support it. Uh, very prominent Republicans support it. James Baker, uh, Howard Schultz, um, uh, a number of other prominent uh, uh, people that have, uh, uh, have taken a very public role in it. And what's really surprising, the oil companies have supported it. BP has come out in favor of it. Shell, ExxonMobil, they've all supported it. And one of the reasons you see this kind of support among uh, corporations and among some Republican leadership is that if it were carbon, if the carbon tax were tax neutral, revenue neutral, you actually could see a fairly significant decline uh, in, in personal and corporate income taxes. And, uh, and, and that too is an advantage uh, that, uh, that no other, none of the other options would offer. I think the best argument for it though is that it really works. And we've seen how well it works in British Columbia. They passed a carbon tax in 2008. They have now reduced CO2 significantly uh, within uh, the province. They have reduced the use of fossil fuels. Interestingly, they've reduced the corporate income tax to 10%. They have the lowest personal income tax in the entire country and the fastest growing economy. So it works and because it works so well, I, I think the time has come given the challenges we have as we look at that, that uh, extraordinary problem we're facing in CO2 as we look to the coming decades to use the simplest and most effective way to bring about meaningful ways to address it in public policy through a carbon tax. 
you admirably kept your time. I didn't have to. I didn't have to <laughs> blow the whistle. That was great, Senator Kyle. Is, the floor is there is. somebody who'll give me a signal? Yes, I'll try to give you. Okay, a signal. yeah, thank. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want to do the same, obviously. I think Senator Dashler presented um, in in very summary form. We we agreed to a very short time limit here, so there's not a whole lot of opportunity for for a lot of backup material and so on. But I think he's presented the the key arguments. Uh, so I've thought about them, and I actually developed a little bit of material, which I think. Um, will reveal problems with, with the tax. The biggest problem is that it doesn't work. That is to say, it won't reduce global temperatures. And if you're going to impose this kind of cost on American society, uh, you have to consider what the effect will be. There is a, a lot of material on, the, and there are experts who will give you a lot of different statistics. I'm gonna throw out a couple here, and uh, I wish we had more time because we could probably go back and forth, but the idea here is to measure the effect that the imposition of this tax would have. Now, Al Gore is one of the primary uh, proponents of a tax like this. He uh, has written about a tax that he would propose at $140 per cubic, uh, per metric ton. He would also impose a $1.25 gas tax. Now, the 140 is pretty much at the top end of what people say the cost of carbon is. So that tax should make a lot of difference. And then you add the $1.25 gas tax, which will never pass, but in any event, you add that on there. It should make a big difference. Well, uh, according to experts, it won't. In fact, the most it will do, it'll, it'll achieve the objective of a 25% reduction by the end of this century, which would have at very most, under the most optimistic uh, assumptions at all, it could reduce global temperatures by two-tenths of one degree. Now, if, if you want to read a very interesting book about what you could do with the cost that it imposes, Bjorn Lomborg, who's a professor in Denmark and has written extensively on this, about the alternatives to, to the use of that money, I think is worth reading. Uh, what I quoted just now was from Lomborg uh, in this book that he wrote called Cool It. Um, he uh, it also, in agreement with him, is, is a a uh, fellow at AEI, I'm involved with the American Enterprise Institute, Benjamin Zyker has written a lot about this, and he's even more pessimistic. He said if you do exactly, uh, if you use the calculations of the United States um, National Center for Atmospheric Research and apply it to the UN's um, panel on climate change, uh, and you try to achieve the goal of the Paris Accords, uh, which Senator Dash referred to, uh, you result, the result is an immediate cut in U.S. emissions, uh, U.S. emissions, now just, just the United States, by half. And the, by the end of the century, and that could reduce the global temperature by one-tenth of one degree, which he says is not really even measurable because the standard deviation is 0.11 degree. There are a lot of statistics on this. I hope I just uh, put in your mind this one fact. It is not at all certain that the imposition of such a tax would have any measurable impact on global temperatures. Meanwhile, the cost would be enormous. Um, as Senator Daschle noted, uh, it'd probably have to be revenue neutral in order to pass the Congress. Well, if it's revenue neutral, it substitutes for some other tax. The problem with a consumption tax, which generally I think is, a, if you're gonna tax, consumption tax, I agree, is, is uh, worth uh, examining, but in this case, it does adversely affect lower income people far more than the affluent. Um, they don't have as many options on how to deal with the imposition of the tax, which applies really to all goods and, uh, th that you buy because everything has got to get here by some transportation, which of course uses fuel. And so, um, th and they don't have the options that, that the wealthy do and it's a bigger percentage of their income. So you probably have to give some kind of a rebate and most of the proposals have a rebate Wherever you cut the line off, you want to be below the line because that's where you get the, get, get the rebate. But that means that the revenue that you're taking in is a lot less than what was produced by what you're substituting for. Corporate income tax cut is a great idea. That's the, uh, what's the primary proponent of the, uh, the tax uh, proposes that. Um, I'll find the name here, but uh, that, that's, that's there. You get the most bang for the buck if you cut the corporate rate. The, but the problem is, I, I don't think Congress is ever going to cut corporate taxes by imposing a tax on consumers for something that everybody uses a lot of and is gonna cost them money. Uh, so I don't think it's practical. And the final point is that the cost to our society would be astronomical. In fact, uh, let me just quote a couple people that obviously you've uh, heard of. Um, 
Bill Gates, uh, the cost of decarbonization using today's technology is beyond astronomical. Lomborg, again, cutting carbon is extremely expensive, especially in the short term, because the alternatives to carbon emitting fuels are few and costly. And there are many more that make the, make the point. The cost of the Gore, 140 per metric ton that I quoted to you, 160 billion annually, annually in the United States, again, a very conservative estimate. And if you apply worldwide to the uh, Paris Accords, you get upwards of like $40 trillion, which takes an awful lot out of the economies of a lot of countries that can't afford it. So the bottom line is that it won't do the job, and it's going to be very costly, and I don't think that uh, as a result the Congress would, that it's realistic to expect that the Congress would end up adopting it. Close enough on time? Admirable on time. So why don't we have a back and forth? Well, no, so, Tom so gets Tom, the final yeah, word. Tom, Tom, yeah, Tom, Tom, okay. Ahead. I would just make three points. I, 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 I think we'd have to agree to disagree on whether this is going to work or not. I, I think there's just substantial evidence that when you put a price point on carbon, it's going to have an economic effect. And, uh, and uh, there have been countless economists and a number of studies that have been done that have shown just what an impact it could have, dramatic impact. And if you make it revenue neutral, you aren't going to be generating um, more of a burden on society itself. You're redirecting those resources, and I think that's key. I think the most important point I can make, though, is that we only have those four choices. And I don't think that John would be supportive of more regulation. I don't think, and I don't think I would either, frankly. Uh, I don't think either of us would be in favor of greater subsidization. I don't think that we really want to get into a cap and trade system as elaborate and complicated as they are, and they haven't really shown Europe's hasn't worked that well. The only option we've got that can really at least show some promise is, is this one. And, and we've seen, and as I say, Br British Columbia has, has just really uh, clearly shown in the last 10 years that it's worked extremely well there. At, at, and in fact, they've got the strongest economy in Canada. So I'm hopeful that maybe with greater dialogue and greater opportunities, we can find the common ground we're looking for here too. <laughs> Okay, so in our third segment, we agreed to focus on an institution that both of you know very well and to th think about why uh, it is not functioning as well. Both of you mentioned this, not functioning in the way it, it should, it's not producing compromises, le legislative compromises and governing um, in the way it should. So let me again start with um, Senator Daschle. And, and ask why do you think Congress itself is not functioning in the way it should? There will always be in our lifetimes two parties with some names standing for particular principles and there will always have to be compromises and, and debate and deliberation. Why is it not working the way you may have seen it work in, in, in better terms? Rules and norms, I would start with that. Rules and norms, uh, we changed. In the interest of making the Senate work better, we did two things with the filibuster over the last 30 years that have both proven to be, in my view, mistakes. Uh, the first is that we started something called dual tracking. If there was a filibuster on a bill, we just set it aside and take up something else. And that just made it so much easier to filibuster um, because there was no pain in that. The second thing we did is we removed the talking filibuster. You no longer have to hold the floor to filibuster. Lyndon Johnson um, was majority leader for six years, from 54 to 60. You know how many filibusters he had in six years? One. The filibuster around the Civil Rights Act of 1957. You know how many filibusters there's been in the last six years? 422. That says all you need to know about the filibuster system today. That's number one. Number two, the airplane. Um, the airplane has changed the way Congress functions. It's regrettable to me, and this isn't much of a, an exaggeration, senators and congressmen leave on Thursday afternoons, they come back on Tuesday mornings, we try to run the country on Wednesdays. You can't run a country this complicated on a little bit more than a day a week. And that, to me, is a huge, huge problem. 52 members now sleep in their sofas uh, in Congress. It's a form of public housing I detest. <laughs> and, um, you know, so that, too, is, a, is, a, is an issue that I think has to be addressed. Uh, John and I may disagree on this one, but I think money. You know, the average senator has to raise $15,000 a day, every day he or she's in office. 
and uh, the money chase, and you sit in these little cubicles, and you call, dialing for dollars, um, hour after hour after hour, day after day. And it generates, in the last two years, if you have a competitive race, it can mean up to 50, 60, 70% of your time. So that, too, is a problem. And then finally, there just isn't enough opportunity. I could go on, but I, I know we have limits in time. I would just say one other thing. I don't think there's enough effort to socialize like there used to be. And, you know, it, it used to be where there really were opportunities for us to get to know each other. If you don't know somebody, it's hard to work with them. And if it's hard to work with them, it's hard to compromise. And it's hard to find some agreement. And uh, the level of interaction among senators today isn't anywhere near the way it used to be. And then I, I would finally go back again. We can't emphasize the, the impact the social media and the media has had uh, enough. But uh, all those factors are playing themselves out. Senator Kyle. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Senator Daschle. Um, however, I think something that deserves a little conversation is the, it, this is very arcane, so we'll try to summarize it here. The technical filibuster requires you to be on the floor and keep talking and you finally get tired. But if you have friends who will, and, and so I, I think Senator Dashley is, is right, by making it easier to filibuster, you just encourage it. On the other hand, if as a political matter, the two parties are unified together and diametrically opposed to each other, it's not hard to find enough friends to keep the filibuster going. And worse, the only way you break a filibuster is to have 60 senators who will agree to stop it. And if a party is totally unified, today it's uh, 48 on the Democratic side, 52 on the Republican side. So it doesn't matter what Mitch McConnell can do with his 52 senators for most questions. If he can't get at least eight Democrats to come along, the amendment or the bill doesn't pass or the nomination doesn't go forward. Well, not nominations do now. So. Um, if you had the old, the old times when you had a lot of back and forth, compromise, negotiation, uh, working across the aisle, you could break a filibuster because you could get the members of your party and a bunch of members from the other party. But if the so-called opposition party to whatever is being proposed wants to stay together, uh, they can keep the filibuster going forever and you can never get cloture and eventually the majority leader just has to pull the bill from the floor because he can't go forward. So I think it's that is a, uh, a tactical uh, result. So what is the cause of the two parties being so unwilling to work with each other? And there I think one of the key things is this radio, talk radio and TV. I cannot emphasize enough how toxic that has made Washington become. As a, if you're not courageous as a member, you've got these people that are telling your constituents, your base every day, how you better toe the line and do A, B, or C, or they're gonna run somebody against you. And there are a lot of people that get scared, and so they just sort of timidly follow along there. Uh, and this makes the media people more and more and more powerful. And there are other groups, it's not just media. There was a think tank that began to bully members a lot on my side of the aisle. And by the way, there are similar ones on the Democratic side, now that I think about it. And they, and, and they bully too. And boy, if you don't do what they want, here, here are a couple of different examples. There are, I, I don't know which one you, would you pick on the Democratic side, but certainly the, the National Rifle Association would be one. If you're a Republican, you better be on the right side of them or they will make political life very difficult for you. Which, what, pick, pick one on the Democratic well, side. I, I, what I think your point is, I, without, I don't know if I, I think, the, I think the bases are far more uh, volatile and far more confrontational. That, and the expectations about what I said earlier about finding common ground or standing your ground, they're demanding that Democrats and Republicans stand their ground, that compromises capitulation. And, and, and John's right, that, that is where we have a problem today. I've, I've actually talked to senators who have said, look, I, I'd really like to work on this. Could we do it? Privately, yeah. I, I really I don't want to be seen as out there working with the other side right now. Um, Each of you has raised. Can, can I just tell a quick yeah, story? Sure. One of the county Republican organizations in Arizona a few years ago passed a resolution censoring our former colleague John McCain because, and there was a long list of, it's like the Declaration of Independence, but one of them was that <laughs> he talks to Democrats. <laughs> So. 
each of you has each of you has mentioned a range of possible causes, and I want to focus maybe on one because each of you have mentioned the power of new forms of media. It seems to me they are empowered because of this phenomenon of concern about re-election and and campaigning. So it seems to me a century ago, we had a very good idea to remove corruption in parties. We were going to have primary elections for every office. And the paradox seems to be that senators, even though they have a six-year term, never have space away from the concern about re-election. Because someone on talk radio or another new form of media or someone can say, how dare you talk to someone from the other party? How dare you compromise? The, the, noun primary has been turned into a verb. We will primary you, right? So is there a paradox of a little bit too much focus on elections and that sort of basic democratic right, but it's preventing the system from working because the people elected to public office think that they can't spend time in Washington, D.C. They have to get back to their home district or their home state to sort of keep the fires down. And so what, what could we do about that? Or is there no way to modify the primary election system? Do we just have to look to other, other issues? I, I, don't, I think there are a lot of things we can do. I, you know, that's, I was saying earlier that we really have to be engaged. We have to work at it. Well, part of working at it is, is participating in the primaries. You know, the average voter turnout today in primaries in the, in the country is a little over 25%. That means 75% of the people don't even care to vote. What that does is, is give those who do vote all the more power and all the more influence and the ability to threaten these primaries because they, they can control the outcome of those elections so long as the voter turnout is so low. Um, you know, there are different proposals to how you might rearrange a primary too, where the two top vote getters vote, uh, uh, vote in the, or, or uh, compete in the general. California has that now. Uh, I think we need a few more elections to see if that's working. I think when it comes to the House of Representatives, the way we've gerrymandered the districts uh, to make it so certain that you're either going to elect a Democrat or a Republican in these districts, uh, make uh, primaries all the more a problem, I think, as it, as it relates to when the primary is more important than the general, you're going to have a lot of uh, members of Congress who are going to be looking at that base vote uh, and worried about getting primaried because it's the more important of the two elections. All of those things matter. I think as, as Senator Dash alluded to regarding some of the Senate rules, one has to be careful about uh, what reform uh, you, you choose. There was, uh, I, I, I've forgotten the author, but there's a a book written, I thought it was Tale of Two Cities, but in any event, this, uh, the gal is sitting there knitting and she says to the interlocutor, reform? Sir, don't talk of reform. Things are bad enough already. <laughs> and I just caution those who may find a, an institutional or system, quote, reform, attractive as a solution to some of these problems, beware of unintended consequences. Um, I think uh, Senator Dash and I would probably disagree about a couple of these things, but I, I'll, I'll just throw out my opinion on something. My good friend John McCain and, and uh, Russ Feingold passed a bill to uh, make it less likely that people could contribute significantly to the political parties and to the candidate. I think that's been a bad, that the results of that, even though the intention was good, the, the result has been bad because it's taken a lot of campaigns out of the hands of the candidates themselves and put it in the hands of people running independent expenditure committees, one form of which you don't even have to have the donors disclosed, and they end up with most of the advertising running, and the poor candidate is saying, well, wait, wait a minute, I, I, that's not really what I'm trying to campaign on here. And so reforms can be detrimental. There, there are a lot of unintended consequences, so beware of anything that looks like you could do, for example, with the primaries in the uh, or the gerrymandering of House districts. It is a problem, yeah, you're exactly right. So how do you resolve it? Well, I've seen as, you know, the independent commission. At the end of the day, somebody has to break the tie in the independent commission. So it usually boils down to one person who has political leanings, may not have disclosed them before, but that comes out in the way that it all gets done. And so at the end of the day, you still have politics involved in redistricting. I don't think you're ever gonna get rid of it. So, Yes, there are some things that you want to talk about doing, but think it through very carefully about the consequences before you think that's the magic solution. I think 
that once again, the solution here is a change of attitude, strong leadership, and people being engaged. At the end of the day, you can make our system work with that. Could I just pursue the question of members not knowing each other as fellow citizens and fellow human beings because they spend such little time in Washington together. Is there a leadership role there? I mean, in our system, the, the rules evolved in the Senate so that it's more difficult for the majority leader to set a rule for, for all senators. It's a, it's a unanimous consent body. So this would probably be easier in the House. But is there a set of rule changes that could be made to say, we just have to make a rule that you've got to be here on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays so we can have three days to work. Is that possible, or are there, would there be unintended consequences of that? I, I had the good fortune to write a book about all of this uh, called Crisis Point, and I'll plug it if I can with my a very, very dear friend, uh, Trent Lott, who's a very close friend of John's as well. But Trent and I wrote the book, and it came out a couple of uh, years ago, and, and we have several chapters uh, devoted to that question. And one of the things that we, th and, and we certainly don't in any way want to imply that the current leaders ought to do what we did, but I think there are things that I think uh, just naturally sound like they, they could, could be helpful and things that, that we learned were helpful when we were leaders. One was having five-day work weeks, three, three weeks a month. So you've got a longer period of time when you can actually, you know, legislation takes on a momentum after a little bit. You know, you, you start negotiating and, and uh, then, you know, you think, well, let's meet again tomorrow and let's, you know, there's a momentum. But if you're only there, just uh, Tuesday and Wednesday or Wednesday and Thursday, that momentum breaks down. You don't get that same rhythm as you go through the legislative uh, negotiation process. That's number one. More joint caucuses. Uh, I once asked one of my former colleagues when the last time they had a joint caucus was. He thought it was a couple of years ago. Uh, can you explain that, a joint caucus? A joint, meaning? well, the caucus, uh, there's the, 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 the group of Republicans and the group of Democrats in the Senate are, are called caucuses. And uh, there's a caucus meeting, uh, now it's three days a week, um, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And, um, uh, but the Wednesday is usually the more important one. And um, um, they're, they really become pep rallies. Um, the leader stands up oftentimes uh, more and more and you know, it, it, it's, you gotta stay with me and we've gotta, you know, you, you really try to, to get them. It's almost like a sports event. And, um, and so they're charged out and we're gonna, we're gonna go get them. You know, we're gonna get on the floor just like a, like a football game. And uh, there's that rah-rah feel oftentimes to a caucus meeting. And if you had joint meetings, and, uh, and, and John and I experienced impeachment, we experienced 9-11, we experienced the anthrax attack in my office and the Senate. And after each one of those, uh, Trent and I uh, concluded that we really ought to have joint sessions to figure out how we're gonna work through all of this. And those joint sessions were the only way we got through impeachment, the only way that I think we got through effectively 9-11 and the anthrax attack. So those were private sessions, but private the Republican sessions, caucus the record, in the Senate, the Democratic caucus in the Senate, exactly, a gathering together. came together. together. Yeah. And, the, and we just don't do that kind of thing anymore. By the way, that's within the power of the leader. You, you set the agenda when you were leader on when the first, what, what ordinarily happens, and each leader is different, but right now, the first vote is at 5.30 on Monday on some insignificant, no, I shouldn't say it, on the nomination of a judge, who I'm sure is very important to his state. <laughs> uh, but that's the bed check vote. Brings everybody back to you. Make sure you're back there by then. So the real business doesn't really start until sometime Tuesday morning. And then, uh, I don't know whether it was you or Trent that, that made the phrase famous, but they say that the Senate runs on, on two rules, uh, unanimous consent and jet fumes. And the idea is by about three o'clock Thursday afternoon, the senators are smelling those jet fumes that will take them back home to be there by Thursday night so that they can have a full day of Friday doing stuff and then Saturday and Sunday with their family. And of course, you wouldn't dare travel on Sunday afternoon back to Washington to be there Monday morning. You're gonna travel on a work day, Monday, and so on. But you had the power to, change, to say when the first vote was going to be and so on. Um, what, what could the leaders do to, and you had the power to schedule caucuses with if the other right. side would agree. Exactly. No, I think that's, you know, as I say, I don't want to be critical of either leader today, but I, I think 
Joint caucuses could, could, could make a difference. Five day weeks could make a difference. Having more opportunities to do things out, outside the, the, the hill itself, you know, just social events that, that allow for greater uh, opportunities to get to know one another really could make a difference as well. Good. And some of that in private, but also it would be good to see some of it in public. Good for the exactly. citizens to see Republicans and, and Democrats. I, 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 I yeah. think you could see the results of it in public, but getting there might frequently need to be yeah. done in press. Yeah. And, and I'll just say this. The other thing I learned, C-SPAN is, is largely a very good thing. And we have television tonight, and I'm glad this is all being televised. But C-SPAN has really changed the atmosphere as well. It used to be in the old days uh, uh, that senators came to the floor to talk to the other members. Now senators come to the floor to talk to that camera. And it changes the way they're, they're talking to that base. They're talking to, you know, they want to make sure that their base hears what it ever is they're saying. So that also adds to the polarization. We had an experiment during impeachment. I don't know if John remembers this. We couldn't decide whether it all should be televised or whether it should be um, an executive session. So we made an agreement that at six o'clock every night we'd go into executive session. It'd be televised until six, private after that. The contrast in the debate and the give and take was absolutely phenomenal. People were very emotional. People just kind of laid out, they spilled their guts out sometimes and just really gave some of the best speeches I've ever heard in the Senate were during the nighttime when, when people could be that honest and open. Nowadays, They've got to be worried about that camera and the scrutiny that comes with it. Every word is uttered and broadcast, and that makes a big difference as well. well can, can I just say, yeah. to me, the biggest bottom line problem is members being vilified for compromising, for, for even negotiating with the other side. And at the end of the day, that's people. People have to decide that's not a a good thing. The constituents need to know that and decide it. And the members either need to be taught the lesson by the constituents through elections or come to that realization them, them, themselves. Because you've got to be willing to and have the political ability to negotiate with each other. Well, speaking of constituents, we're now going to take a brief break and move to our final segment, which is the time for questions from the audience. We're taking a break so we can set up the, the microphones uh, in the aisles. So. Good. All right. Okay. So what I would ask is that you briefly identify yourself, and then please do keep your uh, questions brief so we can get a few uh, questions from the audience. Oh, hi, my name is Jay Kittery. I'm a senior at ASU studying political science, U.S. history, and negotiating for a third major with Dr. Chris. <laughs> but, uh, so I have questions for each segment and a wild card question. Do you want to pick which one should I should Just ask one question. You? No, 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 I'm asking which one you want to answer. Uh, so I'll, I'll go with the uh, wild card question. Uh, so I guess we've, you've all seen the Senator Corker Tobacco, let's say, and uh, what something that he mentioned was a lot of senators are having the same thoughts but are not expressing. That was the same in during Obama administrations and the Democratic caucus that a lot of senators were critical on the Democratic side and did not want to discuss. Uh, another point, uh, Congressman Biggs from Mesa here uh, voted against a resolution to uh, reaffirm our commitment to Article five of NATO because he said that's not in line with the president's agenda. Uh, I feel like uh, the senators have forgotten, not senators, uh, congresspersons have forgotten that uh, there is a separation of power and they are not subordinates to, to the president of their own party. And there should be much more unity within the Congress than within the parties with the executive branch. Uh, how, what, what are your thoughts, thoughts about that and how would you recommend to fix that problem? I would just start with a true story. I, when I got elected leader, uh, I, uh, President Clinton was in office, and uh, he asked me to come down the very day that I got elected. And, uh, but I thought I would go to, uh, to Senator Byrd, who had been leader for a long, long time, to ask him what advice he'd have for me as I had my first official meeting with the President of the United States as the new uh, Democratic leader. And Senator Byrd uh, said something that I've never forgotten. He said, you tell President Clinton that you work with him, not for him. And I think that's, uh, 
that was good advice. Uh, I, I actually said, said it to him, and I, <laughs> I, uh, uh, but I tried to say it in as diplomatic a way as I could. But I, but that was really that kind of created a mindset for me. We don't, you know, Congress doesn't work for the president, even president of the same party. Uh, you have to work with them. Uh, but Congress has has uh, extraordinary responsibilities. Responsibilities involving oversight, responsibilities involving declarations of war, responsibilities involving appropriations um, that require you to work with, not for. And I'm hopeful that we can see more evidence of working with rather than for going forward. Uh, thank you, Sanders. Um, my question is regarding the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, we have had 435 uh, representatives since 1911, um, even as the population has exploded, uh, which has diluted the ability of any citizen to contact the representative and have them be representative for their ideals. Uh, how do we change that? And um, if we were to make that more proportional to the amount of people that are around today, would that be an effective solution to uh, the gridlock that we have in Congress? I'll take one shot at it. it, it you're weighing two different values here. Uh, how big is, is too big? There is a point at which the House would be too big if you were setting the level of people to be represented by each uh, representative too low. Um, it's just a matter of fact that it's going to increase as, as time goes on and we have more and more citizens. I would probably come down on the side of leaving the numbers where they are because the ability to represent more people is, is uh, I mean, with our instant communication, with our ability to travel, the ability of constituents to communicate with us, the incredible network of associations and lobbyists that are constantly getting information to their members and so on. I think the people, if they exercise, have a pretty good opportunity to influence their representative even as the number of people that you represent uh, increases. If you increase the 435 too much, you're gonna have a very difficult, uh, I, I think logistically, it just becomes really, really hard then for that body to function. Tom and I both served in the house for eight years, so. Uh, where would oh, you John, I agree completely. I, 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 it's hard to change the number for pure purposes of management. 435. I, I, I was in very junior ranks of leadership in the House, and uh, we had a, a real elaborate whip system, and, and even with all of that, it was very, very difficult. There's a majorityism uh, to the House that's different than the Senate because of the ability to filibuster, and that gives the majority party in the House a lot more power, uh, and so they can use rules to their advantage in that regard. But I think expanding the number would probably be very difficult. And for the reasons John's noted, I think it's probably even uh, more uh, manageable as a congressman to his constituency today than it ever has been before. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, Senators. My name is Jack Batalzi. I'm an academic advisor here for Barrett the Honors College here at ASU. And my question involves uh, the carbon tax that we talked about today. Um, I was wondering, and this question is mostly directed at Senator Kyle, but both are, can obviously answer, is this idea of like, shouldn't we assign some kind of monetary value to how much we value climate change and what it's doing to society? Because I feel like by not assigning a tax or some kind of policy to it, we're showing the world that we don't value it or we don't believe in it, which I think science should show that we should value and we should do something about it. Additionally, uh, Senator Kyle, in terms of like the dollars and cents argument that you're making, are you keeping in, in account the devastation in our southern states and what that's doing to our economy? Yeah, I, I you know, we, we had, I had eight minutes, I think. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot you can cover. What I was trying to do in my response to Senator Daschle who, who made arguments that I would anticipate, except for one, which I didn't get a chance to respond to, but um, uh, was to illustrate that there are opinions out there on both sides, that there is data out there that you can use to have a rational debate. Uh, you don't have to question each other's motives. You, you don't have to say that the other guy is just in the pocket of big oil or, or whatever it is. Um, you can argue the policy based upon things that you can analyze and, and rationally discuss. Um, on, uh, let's see if I, uh, yes, there are groups 
who have assigned uh, a, a carbon uh, value, a carbon cost is, is what they call it. Um, and uh, we, we could, I, I have sources here if you're interested in it. But yes, that is done. It's done by lots of organizations. I don't know if there's sort of a common definition of it, but, uh, but you can find definitions of how much they think the cost of uh, carbon in the society is. And you need that precisely to evaluate a cost-benefit analysis. And so you can measure the cost that it, that it imposes on our society to have that potential rise in temperature and what the cost of trying to do something about that is, and you can weigh those two things together. And uh, the one thing I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to respond to was, and you should have the response to this, but I think there are more than four ways to address the problem. <laughs> one of which is to spend a lot more money on R&D on things like uh, storage batteries to, for use of wind power and solar power and so on. But I cheated by getting <laughs> the last word in, so <laughs> take it away. <laughs> well, I would, just, I would just say from a tax policy perspective, you can tax pollution or you can tax production. And I think we're better off taxing pollution I agree completely with John. I, I've long supported a consumption tax, and I hope someday we can get one because of its simplicity and administration. Uh, but taxing pollution seems to me to be a better option than taxing production. Senator, I'm John Webster. I'm an alum here at ASU and have a son attending. I had a question. It's unusual both of you were leaders in the Senate. Have you reflected what were those leadership qualities that, uh, that cause you to be selected for those positions? And then is there a change w in the current Senate? Would you be elected to a leadership position today? Or have we, are we picking, uh, are we using a different set of criteria to pick our leaders, which may be part of the problems that we talked about? That's a good question. I probably wouldn't get elected today. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do think Leadership, unfortunately, has become more shrill in the Senate and the House, and uh, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, what does it take to be a good leader? Dean Rusk was the Secretary of State for John Kennedy, and he made a comment once that I've reiterated probably a thousand times, that the best way to persuade is with your ears. And uh, by that he meant you've got to be a good listener. And leaders sometimes, I think, who listen well are better than listens who talk more than they listen. And so that's one, by that I think, I'm, what I mean by that is I think you've gotta be inclusive, you've gotta be collaborative, you've gotta be open, you've gotta be willing to, to build bridges. And um, uh, obviously you need the other talents that anybody in politics need. You have to be able to speak to uh, a larger audience, you have to be able to articulate to the extent you can, whatever ideas you have. Uh, but I think that that's core. You've, you've really got to be a good listener, and you've got to be a, you've got to have a vision for where you want to take your organization, um, and um, that's hard to do, uh, even with a hundred uh, United States senators as opposed to 435 in the House. Senator Kyle, you want to? Well, all of that is true. Um, three of the four leaders in the Congress today are very skilled tacticians of politics. And they live and breathe politics and always have. Uh, the fourth one is learning <laughs> fast, I suspect. Um, so what has been prized, and I think is increasingly prized, is the ability to defeat the other side. And there ought to be a larger purpose. Uh, so, it's, but, but the members will elect you if they trust you to do what they want done and to take care of them. And Senator Daschle was very appealing in that regard. He did listen. He was very patient um, and he was very calm about things, even when there was a lot of strum and drang around some big issue. Uh, and, and so was Trent Lott, whether they were counterparts, and, and that worked well. If you, if you make politic, let me just summarize it this way. You can have philosophical differences and even ultimately narrow them to the point where you can reach an agreement. 
But if your differences are partisan political, no, it's all about power. It's a win-lose, not a win-win game. If I benefit, you lose, and vice versa. And right now, there is too much of setting everything up to disadvantage the other side and cause your side to look good. And until that can be stopped, we're going to continue to have the kind of situation we do and elect those kind of leaders. And I'm casting no aspersions to the leaders who are there right now. Two of them have been there a long, long time. So it's, it's not like they just got elected because they were, they were good spear carriers. Um, and certainly the, the third one has, has been a very effective member of the Senate for a long time also. So um, again, it goes back to what do you want to accomplish? And the American people have to figure that out, and then they have to instruct their leaders, and then the kind of leaders can come to the fore who are, who are able to carry out those instructions. Okay, let's just have br brief questions, please, and brief answers oh, okay. since we're running a little short on time. Sorry. So just Great. we'll take we'll take three more, but please be brief. And, yeah. Hello, my name is Maxime Quint. I study economics and applied mathematics here at Arizona State University, number one in innovation. <laughs> uh, my question for you two senators, you've had very good rapport this evening. The word that I've heard most is, I agree. What has allowed both of you to speak so kindly and work well with each other that senators today in Congress lack? <laughs> Well, for one thing, we're not in the game right now. That helps. <laughs> um, secondly, we never had, a, had occasion to have a fight with each other, and I think we have personalities that tend to try to find agreement or common ground than not. Um, let me stop there. No, just in the interest of time, I'll just say the first answer is the best one. We're not in the game. You know, the game requires an enormous... When you're in the arena, the pressure that we've tried to articulate tonight uh, to describe is, is immense. And uh, that not being in the arena is just, it, it's night and day. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, Senator Nash and Senator Kyle. My name is Abby Dubke, and I am a teacher from Chandler, Arizona. Uh, Two brief things. First, you mentioned the idea of the cameras rolling and how much pressure that puts on members of Congress. The Supreme Court does not allow cameras in the courtroom. Why can't Congress do the same? And two, and what would it change? You mean, why, why can't the court do the same? Uh, no, no, court, why couldn't Congress right. prohibit cameras? Oh, okay. correct, yeah. yes, thank you. Yeah. And two, um, you mentioned also the ideals of our citizenry and how that has helped uh, when you were both senators to create an, an arena of civility. What role can the national government play in helping to foster better civic education as opposed to solely focusing on what, what wonderful, but only focusing on STEM education? Well, to the first question, I would say that transparency in democracy is really important. And I don't want to minimize how important C-SPAN is in improving the level of transparency. That's a good thing. But there is a downside. There are the unintended consequences. And that primarily, in my view, is candor. The, the unintended consequence is the loss of candor uh, and the fear of repercussion that uh, the, the, the camera produces. Um, I, I do think that we've, John mentioned this early on, and I think he's absolutely right. We haven't put the emphasis on curricula like I wish we could um, uh, at, at the I, I'm here in part because I had a wonderful teacher, Sister Morris Crowley. She was an Irish woman, uh, a big woman. She said she always wanted to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, and God made her a basilica instead. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she told me that, that I was one day, she thought that public service was the highest calling in our society, and that if I did anything right, it would be to give public service real thought about. And it, it just really made a huge difference in my life. I, I think, in yes, you, you, could, uh, you could turn the cameras off, but I, realistically, that wouldn't work now. And it's not the biggest problem. We just have to work around that problem. There are a lot of meetings that take place in the Capitol that aren't televised, <laughs> obviously. Uh, I, I think the federal government uh, isn't the entity to pay attention to the curriculum, although 
leaders at the federal level can lead in that regard. I think it's the example that they set that's the important thing there. But I do wish that at the state and local level there were more, there's more consideration to, um, to not trying to whitewash anything or, or to uh, take sides in debates and so on, but to see if there are things that ought to unify us. It seems like there's less and less that does. One of the commentators said, it's about all it is is the Star Spangled Banner and the Pledge of Allegiance, and now that's under attack. Well, there's a lot more than that. Identify what there, what there is, and uh, not just for the sake of uh, kumbaya, but uh, to try to get back to helping people work together. Can you identify some common principles that they can work around and then find an, an ability to work, work together? A last brief question and brief answers. Okay. Um, we started this evening by talking about distress both on and off campus in terms of demonstration and violence, et cetera. We also understand that as representatives or as congresspersons uh, you represent, whether you're a senator or a house member, the full district that has elected you, not just the 25% that has voted. So a lot of the stress comes from the fact that people feel like their voices have been unheard and their needs have been unmet. And if, it, in fact, it's simply a political game to be in a Congress, you're concerned just with getting elected rather than being a public servant. So what did you do or what would you recommend to congressmen and women today so that they really do represent the diverse constituencies in their full districts and don't just cater to the 25% who vote? And does it make a difference that the majority of Congress is white and male? And so how can they be educated on the perspectives of the real democracy that exists, the real diversity? That's a great question. I, I, you know, I, I think there are two motivations that's oftentimes ascribed to politicians, to either be something or to do something. I, I wish we had uh, more appreciation of the importance of doing something, even if it had political consequences. I don't, I think these days we, there's just so much concern about re-election and so much effort around re-election that the do something part of the role of Congress is not given the kind of priority it deserves. I, the question is what did we do? I, I tried to reach as many people as I possibly could, whether, whether they were going to be part of my political base or not. First of all, I didn't know exactly who was going to support me and who wasn't. Uh, so you just get out and you see as many people as you can. You don't restrict it to your comfort zone. In, in politics, they, they talk about getting out of your comfort zone. Reach out to people that, that you don't necessarily meet on the street every day and try to understand them because you can't really be a good representative uh, unless, that, unless you understand. Second, um, understand that at any given time, 45% of the people disagree with you, 55% agree with you, and you're supposed to represent everybody. So you can't just say, well, the majority wins every time. And finally, I learned late in, my, in the last half of my political career that the best way to legislate nationally is to give the other side some percentage of the victory and try to get your due percentage of the, if you're in the majority, then you need to get 55% of that bill, but give the the minority party, 45% of the bill. First of all, you'll get to agreement a lot faster that way. And the country is divided, 45-55 or 50-50. It's hard to do that when people are saying, you've got to be pure, and if you're not, we're going to replace you with somebody who is. So if you have those attitudes and you still have the skill to get elected, I think we, we can succeed. It takes courage. Yeah, it takes courage. Well, with that, I have a few thank yous to say uh, before we give a final thank you to the two uh, senators. So we have a small gift for each of you in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, which does, does have the motto of inspiring leadership and statesmanship for the common good, which I think both of you talked about. Uh, we believe in great ideas and, and books and great debates and also great bottles because we're in the desert here. So we have a water <laughs> bottle uh, and some other things for each of you. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Arizona State University for supporting us. Again, our partners, the Cronkite School of Journalism and the O'Connor College of Law, support we've had from the senior uh, administration. Uh, and I especially want to thank our uh, terrific team in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and, and Leadership uh, for organizing uh, this event, which took quite a lot of effort. 
You are all invited to reception afterward, right, right uh, in, the, in the foyer, and we hope you can uh, stay uh, to enjoy that and perhaps ask a further question or two from the senators. But with that, would you please join me in thanking our two distinguished guests for a wonderful evening.